Cello Tip Tuesday live stream edition. I'm very excited to get your dolls' questions and to see how Chelly and I can help you out in your practice room adventures. And I am doing it much earlier today than I normally do because I know some of you dolls uh, abroad in Europe haven't been able to make these so I definitely wanted to try to get more time zones in on this so as per usual with these live streams I'm gonna wait till I get some questions or I see people pop up in the chat and I'm just gonna jam with Chelly and play some improv and serenade until we get some dolls coming and here we go. a lot in some students so for those of you who might be beginner or intermediate is the use of the bow some commonly made mistakes when people first start playing cello or have been playing cello for maybe a year or two and I see some very common tendencies in how the bow is used so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the frequently made mistakes in bow use. One of them that's probably the biggest culprit is being dependent on the frog. So many people are dependent on the frog and they started it all the time and they miss out on the rest of your bow. and. Often to get a big full sound on the cello, we need to use the full bow. So a couple things you can do when you're practicing is start your scales up bow or in the middle of the bow. So you could pretend your frog is here and you only play this half of the bow. Or, as I said, you start the scales up bow. So, if I were to play a G major scale, okay, and you will notice that you will feel some muscles working here on the back side of your arm. 
And that's really important because if we're always at the frog, then that means you're not training this muscle. So often when students start using more of the bow, they get more tired. And granted, we can use our body weight. I talk about this a lot to sink into the string. We don't have to press or push. We have enough weight on our own. So when you're at the frog, though, you are missing out on some muscle work. And even though, like I said, body weight, using your natural weight is so important, we do use muscles in our arms when we play. You know, it's not like doing bicep curls is going to improve cello playing necessarily. It's, it's not as, um, you know, it, it's not as direct as that, but you are going to be working some muscles. So playing at the tip is going to train that part of your arm. So like I said, start, you can also start at the middle. playing at the frog all the time. Now granted, if a piece you are playing starts down bow, you know, we have to be in the lower part of the bow most of the time. But don't start here. I don't I don't know why people often start here. I'm sure I did it when I was a kid too, but it was so long ago I don't remember why I did it. And start you know, give yourself maybe an inch. It's super rare that you would have to play right where the hair begins. You know, that doesn't really happen a whole lot. So I would say start, you know, a couple inches. Hi, I see we have a couple dolls with us. Hello. We're talking about bow use for beginner cellists. Um, some of the frequently made mistakes, but if you have another question, please pop it in the chat and I would be so happy to pause what I'm talking about and answer your questions. Hello, say, say tick. Hello, I'm sorry, I probably didn't say that right. Um, but yes, we're talking about bow use. And yeah, so when you want to start a down bow, don't start it immediately at the frog like this. You know, it it doesn't give you much flexibility, actually. You might feel super secure because your hand is right here, but really, it, it just, it really actually restricts you more than you think being right up against that metal. So giving yourself a couple inches out is also good. Um, I get, <laughs> I love how you said this. I get told off for bowing too close to the fingerboard. <laughs> you get told off. <laughs> I won't tell you off, I promise. But that is another bowing habit I was going to cover. So I'm so glad you mentioned it. So if you're playing at the fingerboard, there's a couple reasons that happens. First off, Sometimes if your arm, I'll, I'll go to the side, if your arm is too squished in this way, it's going to pull the bow towards you and that's going to cause it to potentially slide up to the fingerboard. So I often tell students, um, lengthen the arm naturally. Of course, we don't want to play with a locked elbow ever and that's obviously way too far. But experiment with this hinge, your elbow hinge, because that's a natural way you can open up your arm and get a little closer to the bridge and away from the fingerboard. So that's one option. The second option is if it happens as you're playing. So maybe you start okay, and then you end up by the fingerboard or you try an up bow and you wind up at the fingerboard. Now, how does that happen? Now we're talking about bow angle. 
Yeah, exactly. Okay. So the bow angle. Now to correct it, I tell my students, here's a trick you can use. Where do you want your sound to go? You want your sound to go out into the audience. You want it to go this way. So often to correct it, when you are starting the bow, you can slightly reach your hand out. Now I say slightly, think like two or three degrees, because of course you can do it the other extreme, but reach out a little bit towards the audience. a little bit it helps me to stay I think more towards the bridge this way and then this way I'm going towards the audience this way now granted you will need to experiment and find out what works for you you know sometimes people do it too much and then you're back at the fingerboard again. So this is a trick you should use in a very small way, a very small amount. Oh, thank you. I'm glad you like that tip. Um, the, uh, so if you are, if you're finding it's still happening, the other option for helping your bow angle is to have the elbow come back a little bit. So I often work with students one on one and I see kind of when is the fingerboard coming into play and then I do these one of two methods. So we talked about reaching out to the audience or swinging the elbow a little bit motion. Oh, it looks like we have a little stall. Okay, we're back. We're good. We're good. We're good. Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> so what I was saying before, um, when I was talking about the elbow swinging back, it's not straight back like this. It's like when you are hugging someone, like you open your arms to hug someone. It's like that kind of pulling back. So if your tip goes this way, you can also bring the arm a little bit back. I hope that helps. Um, you can also, to monitor your bow angle, because a danger is we stare down like this and then our neck is strained because we're staring down <laughs> if you watch your bow too much. So what you can do, you can practice in front of a mirror or you can, what I tell some students is, you can open your webcam on your laptop, um, the general webcam or Skype or Zoom, you can just be by yourself, open it, and you can watch yourself in your laptop screen. You can do it with a phone, but it, the screen isn't as big and you won't be able to see yourself as clearly, but that's kind of a little trick if you don't have a big mirror or I know the way my apartment is set up right now. Um, it's a little awkward. There's not a lot of places I can put a big mirror. So sometimes, yeah, open a video on your laptop and that way you can watch yourself. Okay, we had another question. Do you feel that in your right shoulder as well? My right shoulder tends to get tense when playing on the A string in the higher position, especially when bowing to the tip. Ah, so, um, I'm so sorry. Uh, again, I think I'm not going to say this right. So please forgive me. Um, test kitchen, test kitchen. Um, your question about the shoulder, I believe they typed this back when I was talking about when you're playing at the tip, you feel some muscles working back here. Um, do you feel it in the right shoulder as well? So feel nearly, I nearly got it. That's better than normal. I'll take it. <laughs> um, so the question about 
the shoulder. I wonder, do you feel, does it feel sore? When you say you feel it in your shoulder, I'm curious what you mean by that. Like, is it painful? Oh, I see, you say it tends to get tense. So in cello playing, you never want anything tense or painful. Sometimes a muscle will feel sore if you're just starting and that's normal. But the minute you feel tension or pain, that means something in the technique isn't right. Um, so that's a very clear difference. Um, an example of something being sore but okay is when you first start playing and you don't have finger calluses yet. Um, and your fingers are gonna be sore and tired playing on these metal strings, right? So that's a normal source of fatigue. What you're describing with the shoulder though, usually like 80% of the time, if your shoulders are tense, they're hiking up. And often, this is another thing I notice, uh, actually beyond beginners, I was a culprit of this myself for a really long time. When you bow, so you said on the, on the A string. So in order to draw the bow, my elbow has to come up, right? Just a little bit. And often for some reason when the elbow starts coming up, so does the shoulder. I don't know why, but it just does. I mean, it's a blessing and a curse that are. You can do it. Are we good? Yeah, okay, we're good, we're good. Um, so what I was saying was when you pull the bow, your arm and your elbow has to raise a little bit. So when it raises, for some reason, our shoulder wants to activate and come up. And that's probably where your source of tension is, is possibly when you're on the A string. And the reason I'm guessing this is because when you're on the D, the G, and the C, your elbow isn't coming up nearly to the same extent as the A string. Especially the tip at the A string. So what you could do, a couple things you could do. You could just pick a note. I think you said it's in the higher positions on the A string. Yeah. So you could just pick a note there. Let's do B flat maybe. And... able to move your shoulder because one thing that really blew my mind when I was learning cello was I could not isolate certain parts of my body like for some reason I couldn't like whenever I tried to lower whenever I tried to lower my shoulder my elbow would go down and it took me a long time to realize being able to isolate parts of your body is actually really important. And of course, when you are playing and you're performing and you're in the moment, your whole body's working together, of course. But, you know, being able to do this is important when you're practicing. So I would say, I was on B flat. See if you can drop raise and drop the shoulder and don't have don't have every don't have everything working when you're trying this exercise see if you can only do it on the shoulder um okay and whenever i'm practicing kind of a clear physical thing like your shoulder probably needs to be lower i set benchmarks in a piece so i'll say every two measures 
I'm going to pause and check my elbow, or sorry, my shoulder. Every two measures, I'm going to check my shoulder. Because until the muscle memory is there, when you go to play through a piece, it's just gonna happen again. And I'm, you know, that sounds discouraging, but it's not meant to be, because you need to take the time to practice it and kind of rewrite your muscle memory. I hope that makes sense. So take a piece where you are in a high position on the A string. <clears throat> you can even just do it with your scales, honestly. You could just do the top octave of your scales and you could say, okay, every four notes, I'm going to check my bow. Um, uh, or sorry, if you're gonna do down bow, you should do it every three, so you wind up at the tip. So every three notes. Oh, wait a minute. Okay. Actually, if you do it every three, it's going to get backwards. I would say, <laughs> sorry, but I hope what I'm saying illustrates the point. So if you want to do it very formally with a scale, with a concrete number, start at the tip every two bows. No, that doesn't work either. Ah! I'm not a mathematician, I'm a musician, and I still can't count. Okay. Um, so, unfortunately, it doesn't always work out in an even, concise number, but... You can just use the tip as your marker too. You know, sometimes, so there's different ways. I'm gonna summarize because I feel like I've been blabbing. See, when you guys watch these live streams, I edit, sorry, when you watch my videos, I edit all of this junk out. <laughs> Cause it happens a lot. And then when I do live streams, you get to see, um, I'm kind of a hot mess, but it's fine. I'm just so excited. There's just so many different ideas in my brain um, for you guys to practice and try out. Um, so, moral of this blabbing, when you have a physical component you want to check, like your shoulder, this is our example, the shoulder, use a measure marker in your repertoire. So every two measures, every three measures, I'm going to check my shoulder. Use a part of the bow. In my piece, whenever I get to the tip, I'm going to check my shoulder. So here, a region in your bow is a marker. Third way you can do it, Every time I go above my A harmonic on the A string, I'm going to check my shoulder. So now we're talking about a range region on the cello. So those are three methods, three ways you can have cues in your practicing to check the physicality. And I really, you notice I keep saying within your piece, within your piece. Granted, scales are another way to do it. Absolutely. If you want another way to tackle it, do it in your scales or your etude or your warm ups, but also doing it in the piece because that's your ultimate end goal, right? Is to have the physical ease of playing, no tension, to feel like you're in control. The piece is the ultimate goal. So if all you do is practice it on your scales, your scales, your arpeggios, um, if you do third, sixth octaves, 
if that's all you do it on, it's going to take so much longer for it to translate into what you really want. So supplement it by also doing it inside of your piece. I hope that makes sense. I, I'm glad you think my hot mess mentality is cool. <laughs> I love that. You made my day. Thank you so much. Um, do you have any other questions? Anything? Also, if something I say isn't clear, please let me know. Um, sometimes I think people feel like they're rude if they interrupt and say, sorry, could you actually like explain that again or elaborate on that? And I would rather have you learn and understand it. I don't care, you know. People are shy about that, but please tell me if I'm not making sense. So I guess the theme, do you have any tips for performances? What about the performance? <laughs> what to wear? What to eat? I know that's not what you're asking. I'm just being, um, I'm just being annoying. What specifically about performances would you like to know? My guess is stage fright. That's a very common question that's asked. Um, <laughs> All right, we are back. So what, what about performances would you like to know? I mean, I could just start talking about some tips. Oh, how to get into the first notes, how to prepare. Ah, that's a very good one. And I'm so glad you asked that because that is one of the most challenging things about performing is from the very first note, you're in the zone, you know, and I admit, even myself, sometimes it takes me like a couple measures to like warm up into it, but that's not, you know, measure three, you're performing. You want to be performing in measure one, you know? So a couple things for that. And it doesn't sound like, I've seen videos about people with all of these like little tricks and little things and Basically, if someone's talking about what works for them, um, so what I was saying was if someone's talking about what works for them, it might not work for you. So I'm, I generally do very um, kind of overarching general tips so preparing for the performance physically, I will say first, physically, make sure you're rested and get a good night's sleep. Like there is so much value in a good night's sleep. And I know that because I have not been sleeping very well recently. <laughs> so really, you know, treat yourself the day before the performance, get a good night's sleep. Make sure the day before your performance, you eat, you feel nourished. You basically want to feel normal physically. I know your brain is going to be thinking about the performance and you're excited and you're a little nervous and you have all these feelings, which is normal, but you know, physically really make sure you're in good shape for the performance. And especially the day of too, um, you know, know what works well for your body the day of. And what this is boiling down to is you won't know what works for you unless you perform a lot. And I noticed in college, you know, we have the big recital at the end of the year, the big recital. And you know, if that was the only time you really got on stage and played for people, you didn't learn anything. Um, 
so really try to perform as much as you can if you're in school a lot of conservatories have like monthly concerts where people can sign up and outreach concerts that's an amazing way to perform in a situation that might not feel as high risk to you um playing in you know uh, community venues that have a big aspect on the community playing oh my gosh i love playing in um residential homes for the elderly because they are so i've I mean, that's been some of the most great audiences I've had because they're so thankful that you're taking time to come visit them and play for them and they love the music. And when you are in the moment at a venue or about to do a concert, really see what's going on with your body and your mind because, you know, that's how you learn is by being very self-observant, you know, and what took me also a long time, if you get nervous, it's fine. It's totally fine. You know, if you, if you practice, if you prepare, if you feel ready, you can still get nervous. Um, you know, I practiced way too much in college. I was super big on practicing and over preparing and I still got nervous. So if you feel yourself getting nervous, don't like, oh no, oh my goodness, ah, this, blah, why am I feeling this way? Just let it happen. Just let it happen. Oh, if you're hearing chirps, that's Mr. Bash the cat. Sebastian is coming around my feet for the live stream. Um, so we talked about like the physicality and the mental state, now the playing. Um, make sure you get in a lot of run throughs of the piece you're playing. Lots of run throughs. Um, if you have, if you're in a situation where you can study with a teacher weekly, I usually start doing some run throughs six to eight weeks before the performance. Like, let's say you've been working on a piece all semester and you're giving a recital. I will bring my pianist and I will start doing run-throughs for my teacher about six to eight weeks out. Because by then, you know, I've rehearsed with the pianist. I can play through the piece and then we can fine-tune things. Now, that's not every single week. You know, I might start at six and then five we work on. I don't know, my teacher, maybe they want to work on etudes or to work without the pianist. You know, often once you play for your teacher with a pianist, then you might have a week where the teacher says, okay, you and I just have to work on some things. But then maybe week four, I bring back my pianist and we run through it again and something else. So really make sure you have enough time, like sit down, with a calendar and think at what point do I need to be able to play through everything where I can be comfortable. Usually it's about six to eight weeks from my experience. And then the week of the concert, play it through every single day. I really, that really helps me a lot. Now granted, if you are playing a crazy long recital. Don't play your recital. Don't play the entire recital every single day. Oh my gosh, you would have no arms left by the time you got to your recital. But I would say play one major work every single day. So if you're playing a concerto, maybe play movements one and two. The next day play movements three and four. Um, or if you have a shorter concerto with a sonata, just somehow do a run through of a couple of movements every single day leading up to the concert. Now, if you're only playing one piece, then that's easy. You can just play that one piece every day. And the whole, 
again, this is kind of another point I've been making throughout this word dump about performance, just spilling out my brain, is the more consistent and regular something is, the more normal it will feel and the less nervous you'll get. That's the number one takeaway from this. The more you do something, the more normalized it will feel and it won't feel different. Because I think that kind of fight, flight or fight, that nervous like natural adrenaline we get is when something feels unusual and scary. Well, it's not scary if you experience it more often, right? Like kids are afraid of monsters in their closets at night. Well, they eventually learn, you know, that monster hasn't come out, mustn't be there. I'm not scared anymore. You know, um, also think about like when you were a kid. I, oh my gosh, I had the worst time tying my shoes when I was a kid. I was so bad at tying my shoes. And I thought I was never gonna be able to tie my shoes and I just kept doing it and now you don't even think about it when you tie your shoes. So I like wacky analogies. Those are just a couple. Um, getting into the first notes. That's the last thing I wanted to talk about. Getting into the first notes of your piece. So I would say maybe the, again, when you're doing these run throughs the week of, have a friend or set up a Zoom call with a buddy Playing for somebody helps you to replicate those feelings of being nervous. Um, so let me think of, let me think of something. My favorite, Shashti Concerto. Um, you know, you could sit with a friend, um, maybe another musician or just somebody you trust and play through the piece, talk about it, and then just say, can I start this for you like five times? And just some. And talk about it. You know, thinking back on it, you know, I probably should have breathed a little bit more. I didn't really breathe in the character of the Shostakovich concerto. I think my shoulders were up, so I'm going to do it again. But see, now I was ahead of my bow. My bow wasn't quite ready when I was ready. So I'll do it again. And if you keep doing this and doing this, you will eventually... You're tricking yourself into practicing the opening a bunch of times. <laughs> you know, um, do it in your practice room. Try it out for a couple friends. See what they think. Um, another thing that I do, it's pretty funny. Do you ever vocalize when you play? In your practice room, do you ever, like, talk or... Not necessarily words per se, but like, do you sigh? Do you? So like, I feel like in the Shostakovich concerto, yes, I'm so glad I'm not the only one. I think in the Shostakovich concerto, that, that rest. So for those of you who might not know the concerto, the cello is the first thing that plays, not the orchestra, the cello on its own. And the only thing you get is one beat of a rest. Um, check out my Instagram. I have a lot of sing-along. <laughs> I make words to the Shostakovich concerto. That's one of my weird things. And I sing and I play the Shostakovich concerto. It's fine. The things you do for the socials. Um, so when you have that rest, what's happening in that rest? Is it ah, ba, 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 ba. Is it like a is it like a frustrated grunt? Is it I'm so scared of what's coming? It's 
Like, shh, shh, stop, shh, shh. Like, what is that rest? And do that in your practice room. So if I'm, if I'm thinking it's a grunt, I go, ha! So I literally do that a few times. I just, I get ready and I go, ha! in the concert obviously so you have to feel that eternally and you have to make sure you, you don't let it get into the physicality of your playing so if you imagine a grunt don't tense up like a grunt if anything vocalizing when you play it gets it helps you to release anything you might be holding in your body so go in your practice room and grunt sigh breathe out breathing out before you play is always really good um a lot of people breathe in which is fine but sometimes this like up feeling when we breathe can cause our body to hike itself up so sometimes i prefer to breathe out um i know if you're in a string quartet or something and you have to cue yeah, breathing in, it's a little easier to see the body motion than breathing out. But I hope you're so pumped to perform now. After I just had like an anthology lecture on performing. And there's so many other things you can do. I just listed some of the basics. So to quickly summarize, um, chart out when you want to have the whole piece learned. And yay, I'm so glad you're enjoying it. Um, and when I say learned, I don't mean I can make it through, like I can play through it. Yeah, there are a couple things that need tweaking, but I can play through this. Um, picking your calendar when you want that to happen, aim for about six to eight weeks. Especially if you haven't met with the pianist yet. Oh my goodness, if you haven't met, if you have to play something with piano and you haven't rehearsed with the pianist and it's a big thing like a recital, you should really start meeting with them at the start of the semester or like three months out, four months out. And I'm saying this because you're in school. I'm assuming, I'm guessing, a lot of people seeing this might be in school because you have classes and studying and tests and a social life if you're lucky and all of these things so it might be hard to get regular rehearsals if you're a professional okay maybe you can meet with your pianist maybe a month before the concert and it can be okay because you can really focus on that um and then if you're taking lessons with a teacher start bringing the pianist in six to eight weeks before the concert the performance the recital and then the week of the recital, play through something every single day, one to two movements, maybe more if your pieces are short. Play for people, play for your friends. One thing I did, <gasps> Sebastian's here. Come say hi. Say hi to the people, but don't, don't go on my boat, please. <gasps> oh, this is a special treat. Okay, oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, I get, I get so distracted by the cat cause he's just too cute. Um, <laughs> what was I talking about? Teachers playing, play for people. Yes. You saw the kitty too. Um, play for people throughout this like whole six to eight week period, play for friends. One of the most helpful things I did when I was, oh my gosh, I was like a, a wee baby. I was like a sophomore or a freshman in college and I played for this doctoral student. Oh, how funny, Sebastian's your name. That's so cool. Um, so I played for a doctoral student I admired so much. You know, she's she still is a incredible cellist and I asked her, I was like, could I, could I play a piece for you? Could I play a movement? I think I was playing like Casado Sonata. 
maybe it was a solo sonata it might have been Casado and it was so fun because she was very reassuring and it was a great experience and like by the end of it I was like I'm still here nothing happened to me I was nervous but like it was painless like nothing happened and I got to like chat with her and stuff so playing for people is super valuable drilling the first couple bars in front of people doing it in your practice room is not really super nerve-wracking but be observant drill the first couple measures in and think about vocalizing grunting sighing something to get you into the character before you even play also for some reason when i grunt Sometimes it makes me feel like very in the floor. Like I feel like very, oh, like I'm sturdy. I'm here. I'm ready to go. So I kid you not, sometimes I've been backstage or in a dressing room, obviously where no one's going to hear me. And I just go, mm, 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 like to myself. So I just feel like I'm in it. I'm ready. I'm here. Ah. Um. There's a lot of things you can do, but those are some of my wacky favorites. Do we have any more questions? Um, I see, I saw Jack. Sumo stumps, yes. Why not? Whatever works. Um, Jack, you're just joining us. Did you have a question you would like to ask? I'm gonna go a little bit past one because I started a little late. So I'm gonna, I have time for a couple more questions and maybe, maybe Sebastian will come back on the couch and you guys can see him. I don't know. He wants food. That's why he's hanging around. Um, I'll feed you after, I promise. It's not his lunchtime yet. I tell him every day, but he still insists on always being fed early. Um... Yes, cello doll sumo stomps. Try it out. I love that. Sumo stomps, grunting, whatever works. Um, also, sometimes because when you get nervous, you can get like in your head and you just, you get a lot of stuff going on in your brain and your emotions. And sometimes just a good grunt just releases. <laughs> um, Oh, thank you, Sebastian. Now that I know it's Sebastian. Tips to avoid tension in the left thumb. Mm. You guys are, these are excellent questions because these are all very common issues. Tension in the left thumb. So a couple things. Again, the self-awareness is so important. I'm glad you're noticing it. That's good. That's already accomplishing a lot um, because a lot of people, myself included, have played with tension and don't know, don't know it. Um, and that's a slippery slope. But tension in the thumb, is there a certain point in your repertoire when it's happening? Like forte, when I'm playing forte, my thumb squeezes or right before a shift, I get nervous and my thumb squeezes. So if there's something that triggers the tension, sometimes it's just in general too. There doesn't have to be a trigger. It's just sometimes there is, and that's good to find. Um, so a couple things about the tension. Um, oftentimes we squeeze because we don't feel supported. Bad habit, me too, me too, I did it too. Um, if we don't feel supported, our thumb can squeeze. And a lot of people think, hold on, we're going to get technical here. So a lot of people think when, now pardon me, I know this isn't correct technically, but when we play, people think we push this way and that's how we push the strings down. No. Why would you push on here? It doesn't do anything. Your weight comes from above the string, above the string and pushes in. Nothing back here is going to help you push the string. 
But for some reason, that's what people think, I think. Um, yeah. So what you can do is uh, a couple things you can do. So we want this feeling of pulling down. Now, granted, you can't let your elbow collapse, but sometimes, sometimes what I, uh, what I've done, you can make your end pin extra long, put the curve of the instrument um, a little farther up your knees, so you're sitting. When you sit up, the cello's a lit. You notice it's like kind of away from my body, and I just I feel pulling down this way, and do little hops. Um, I mean, you don't have to do that. You can if it's hard to imagine. You can also do it with normal posture. Um, another thing you can do is called, I do them, or I, I've talked about them with some, I, I think in a video I talked about this, I'm not sure, uh, thumb taps. Now granted, you can't, if, if this is the fingerboard, you can't be doing this all the time with your thumb. They're little taps or little rubs. So if my arm is the fingerboard, um, you can do some little slides or little taps. So you can start this with long tones, scales. Um, uh, tap, tap, tap. Obviously, open strings, open string, tap, 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 or rub the rub the fingerboard. You're most welcome. Bye bye. Now, granted, the pitch is gonna move a little bit, but these are small, like semicircles or baby taps, because if your thumb is squeezing, you won't be able to move it. Same thing with the bow. I talked about this recently on my Instagram with the bow. If the thumb is in motion, it can't squeeze. Now granted, you can't be doing that in your actual playing. I know on the left hand, you can't be tapping or something, but this, this will train your body the feeling of relaxing the thumb, letting go of the thumb, so that when you are actually playing, the end goal is to just have it there resting gently as a guide. That's all your thumb is when it's behind the neck. It's a guide for your hand shape and the position. One thing I did once, I had a teacher told me, whenever you squeeze, just stop. Just let go, pause, play again. If you're squeezing, stop. It ended up working. But it took a long time, and I feel like if I did other things along with that, I would have learned this sooner. Um, so find out if there's a specific reason you squeeze the thumb or if it's just a habit. Try some finger taps or rubs. Very tiny, nothing crazy. Tiny rubs or tiny taps. And then you can try it in some of your repertoire. Um, I hope that helps. I will do this final question from Jack. Do you consciously arch your back? I am always less sure of good sit sitting posture for playing. No, I do not arch my back. Um, no, in general, your, um, your back is pretty straight. Now it's not rigid straight, but it's relaxed. Um, so the way I think of it, so weird, you can't see it, but behind me, I'm just like, I'm feeling what my back feels like when I'm sitting in cello posture. Um, it's almost like my spine is straight and relaxed and I feel it settling into my lower spine by my tailbone. Like, ah, I'm relaxed there but I'm not sinking and I'm not slouching. I'm kind of comfortably on top of my tailbone and my spine's relaxed. Ah, Mr. Kitty returns again. Um, why don't I turn to the side? Hold on, you're gonna hear some chair noise, I'm sorry. Hi, sweetie. 
Ooh. Here I go. Okay. So, um, in turning, so let me just play a little bit so you can see what my back does. this way or that way because if you arch this way the cello is going away from you and that's hard you generally want the cello on your chest so you can come around it um i wonder jack if you might need to experiment with your end pin height um if your end pin height is too high then you are going to arch your back if it's too low then you are going to hunch so i wonder about that i wonder what your tail pin at the bottom is like um can i let me see if i can show you where the cello sits Let me check. I see things sooner in OBS than YouTube, so. Yes. Yeah. So for me, the cello, let me do a little more. The cello is on the inside of this knee. If it's on top, too high. Hi, honey. If it's too low, so I, I feel this corner hugging my knee, okay, like that. So it's, it's nice and secured on this. And it's very similar on the other side with this corner. Resting on the inside of the knee, not floating on top, not sinking on the bottom, just nice and snug in my on my leg i hope that helps uh, all right there we go there we go um cool we're good we're good so yeah, I would also maybe check in on your end pin height. I'm not sure how long you've been playing, Jack. Um, oh, Alexandra. Alexandra, sorry. I haven't had my coffee yet. I'm very impressed with how I'm doing. Thank you for coming. Oh, my goodness. Thank you. Actually, I had back pain for about a year because of cello playing. My back muscles are weak, so I put pillows when playing. Very interesting. Yeah, you do use a lot of muscles in your back. You also actually use a lot of muscles in your core too for cello playing. So having a strong core is also really, really good. I mean, I'm not saying anyone has to do anything crazy. You don't need like abs or anything for good cello playing, no. But like just having, um, because your core and your back help you to hold yourself up. And I definitely noticed when I was in college, I started doing Pilates. Um, and I actually noticed a pretty good difference. My stamina seemed better. Could have just been because I exercised more. But I felt like I was more, I don't know, I felt like I had more, um, Thanks for going into depth. I don't play the cello, but I love your content. Thank you, Jack. 
I hope, maybe you're hoping to play the cello? Yeah, sitting posture for playing. So it sounds like you're starting. I hope that helps. Um, I would go, go to my channel. I have a video, cello tips and tricks. That's my playlist, one of my playlists. Cello tips and tricks. I have a video about sitting with the cello and cello posture. Um, so I have made a video on that if you want to see it. Um, thank you all, my wonderful dolls, for coming to this live stream. Thank you so, so much. I love your questions. I love them. I can't say it enough. I love your questions. I love hearing what you're interested in. I haven't announced this yet on my Instagram, but I want to say it here too. First, woo exclusive, but I've been wanting to make a video, think of it as half reaction video, half masterclass video, where, and it is totally up to you dolls, you can send me a video of your playing. A short video maybe around two minutes and I will react to it and give you feedback and make like a video chain like encouraging you all to practice celebrating your hard work and it's a way for you to get some feedback on your playing for I mean technically yeah for free um, and of course if you submit a video you will, um, you know, you are consenting for me to put it on my YouTube channel and to use it on the YouTube channel. Um, so you have to understand that if you submit a recording, you know, I might edit it for lighting. I wouldn't really edit the sound. No, because, um, but I would edit maybe the lighting if it's a dark video or something like that. Um, so you can send me some videos and I would love to make like a fun reaction, but not just reacting, but helping you guys out and giving you like some quick specific tips and to just kind of make a fun video like that, I think would be really cool. So if you want to submit some videos of you playing, please keep it under two minutes. Oh, you want to send, yay. Yeah, please keep it under two minutes um, and the ways you can submit Thank you. I think it would be too. Um, I know reaction videos are kind of a thing on YouTube, but I wanted, I wanted to make it like more helpful for you guys and more catered to what you're doing. And um, I also know not everybody can make these live streams and ask questions. So this is kind of a way for people to get feedback on their own time. So if you want to submit a video, you can post it on Instagram or Facebook and you tag me at the cello doll or use a hashtag the cello doll. So I'm going to type this in the chat. So if you're going to do Facebook or Instagram, oh, let me just pull my chair. I don't know what I'm doing. Facebook or Instagram, um, use the hashtag the cello doll or, um, and tag the cello doll, okay? Um, so you could do the hashtag, you could tag me. You could also just um, send, send a DM. You could send it to me in a direct message. The last option, um, if none of those work for you, you can email me the video file, the cello doll at gmail.com. So many ways you can submit videos. I think it would be really fun. You know, maybe I could do these every few months or something. Um, and it's also fun for you guys to learn who amongst you are cellists. Maybe you'll see someone's name mentioned and they're in the same love, like they're playing the same repertoire as you and you can have a practice buddy or a new cello buddy. And that'd be really cool. Um, so yeah. That is the info. If you are watching this after the fact, I will put this information in the video description. And 
so so you can see it or if you forget and you want to come back to it i'll put i'll put all of this in the video description for you thank you all so much happy practicing as always you are all so most welcome this was an excellent stream thank you guys so much you've made my day i'm so happy and you know more adventures to come you guys better get ready i have something big up my sleeve i'm so excited but i don't want to give it away yet but something big is coming that i've made and i'm still in the process of editing and tweaking things but i'm very excited so check out my instagram or facebook for teasers <clears throat> excuse me um i'll probably post a couple photos here too but a lot of the teasers go to facebook and instagram all right have a good day my dolls bye bye i'm gonna go feed the cat <laughs>